Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host uh, for today. Um, it's been an awesome day so far, celebrating uh, amazing women in, in science and exploration, conservation, and adventure. And we are so thrilled to be joined uh, right now by Sarah Seeger. Uh, Sarah is a planetary scientist and astrophysicist. She's a pioneer in the world of exoplanets, so looking for planets that orbit uh, suns or stars other than our own. Um, her research ranges from detection of exoplanets uh, and their atmospheres um, to theories about what life on other worlds, how they could have developed, and, and novel space mission concepts. So um, she has her PhD from Harvard University. She's uh, the professor of uh, planetary science and professor of physics at MIT, so the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, she was also recently named one of Time's 25 most influential in space. Sarah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you joining us today. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to now uh, just share my screen so you can see um, I prepared a few slides to tell you a bit about planets outside of our solar system. So, okay, let's see. All right, so I'm here today to talk to you about other planets. And I'll just start by telling you if you don't already know or reminding you if you do know that every star in the sky is the sun. And if our sun has planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc., it seems to make sense that other stars have planets also, and they do. And did you know that we think that every star has planets? and we know of thousands and thousands of exoplanets. Now, to help you understand what kind of planets are out there, I want to, I wish I could give you homework, right? I know I have kids in middle school right now and they don't like, um, they do their homework right away, actually, the second they get home from school, mostly because they want to get it over with. But if I could assign you homework, I would give you this. And it's fun, but it's called Eyes on Exoplanets. It's a software, you can search for it online and download it. I actually have a clip to show you. Over there. Okay, so what it, this software shows you, believe it or not, is like a real map of the sky. And each one of these little white things is a star, a real star out there that astronomers have mapped. And every highlighted object is actually a star with a known planet, a planet orbiting the star. And remember, the star is the sun far away. And this particular software, um, if you click one of the buttons up at the top, it's, well, it's showing you now um, other things. If you click this button, you can go to any part um, of Earth as long as it's nighttime. And this particular simulation was made at NASA in, at a branch in California, J JPL. So they're showing you what would happen if you could go out to the night sky in the springtime about now, uh, a little later from now in the year, and see what you would see in the sky. So what you could do is later, you can click on this. And here, for example, it's showing you the night sky. And look at all those stars out there with um, known planets. They're showing you the constellations as well. And did you know there's a very special patch of the sky? I'm wondering if there's a single person here, perhaps our host Joe, who knows what that one part of the sky is. This patch of the sky uh, is only special in that a space telescope called Kepler looked at one part of the sky for four years, and it found so many planets. Kepler found thousands of planets around other stars. But in fact, if we had the right resources and telescopes, we would see the entire sky is filled with stars. So you can see what the night sky would look like um, near you. But another feature of this software is it also allows you to uh, search for a planet if you would happen to know what the name is. And I don't expect that, but in this particular case, the person who made this video clip chose Kepler 186F. And the software will actually zoom to that part of the sky um, where there's a planet and click on it. And this particular star system has five planets. And one of these planets is very special because it's in a so-called Goldilocks zone. As heated by the star, this planet would be not too hot, not too cold, but just right to maybe host life, to have water. And all life as we know it needs liquid water and have life. And in this search for planets, what we're really looking for are planets that might be able to host life and that maybe even have life on them. And that's what I get to do uh, for my job. Now, in this software, um, everything I showed you is like based on real data so far. But here, it zooms in even further. And you see this kind of uh, art, this uh, zoom in on the planet. But here, I don't know if any of you can see if you have really good eyes. 
at the bottom, it says hypothetical visualization of planet. <laughs> so this part is not real. It's just artists want to show you what the planet might look like um, if you can find it. And if you can download and use the software on the little menu on the left here, it shows you all sorts of things, how long to travel here. We don't have a way to travel to other planets right now anyway. But it, it, I really do encourage you to download the software and to try it out and, and get a sense for yourself about what kinds of planets are out there and what kinds of planetary systems. The only thought I'll leave you with is that out of all of those stars out there, we haven't found a solar system copy. Instead, we find planetary systems that are uh, just crazy. One planetary system, the one I showed you, has about five planets, all interior to what would be Venus's orbit. So there's all different types of planets in terms of their sizes, masses, and orbits, and things like that. The next thing I wanted to share with you is one way we find planets. If you look at the uh, picture here, you see what looks like a sun. Can you see the planet going in front of it? I can't hear you, but if you can see it, um, I hope you see the little dot. That's supposed to represent the size of our Earth going in front of a, sun, a star the size of our sun. But astronomers don't see suns like that. Instead, we see what you're seeing on the bottom graph. As the planet goes in front of the star, oh, I forgot to explain. What the bottom graph is, it's the brightness of the star and it's um, measured in time. So it would be like as if you, you know, pointed your phone or your telescope to the sky and you took a picture every 30 seconds or every minute and you record that data. And you look and see if the star brightness changes with time. And if there's a planet going in front of the star, the brightness will drop by a tiny, tiny amount. And for the students in middle school, what amount it's dropping in, it's essentially the area of the planet pi r squared compared to the area pi r squared of the whole star. And that's exactly how much it's dropping in brightness. And so believe it or not, astronomers have measured hundreds of thousands, maybe a million stars with this technique, looking for a tiny, tiny drop in brightness. And we use computers and computer programs and also just looking at the data to try to see if we see any drops in brightness that could be a planet. So I hope you're with me on this because this is one of the main ways we find planets. And my second, um, if I could assign you homework, would be to tell you, you can help find planets. Even the youngest people here, uh, you could actually help do this. And there's a website called planethunters.org. And if you go to this website, and I hope you'll go to it later, it will actually show you um, how we discover new worlds, new planets, with the in, uh, method I just showed you. And then it actually wants you. It, they need your help to look at data and to see if you see a drop in brightness. And you'll flag that data, and then it will go to a professional. So here what it's showing you is um, how bright the star would be. And this on the bottom is days in terms of time. And so if you look at this, um, and it actually will help you go through a tutorial, but I want you to look at this data here. Do you see this uh, star is being measured with time? And look, it drops. That drop in brightness is what they want you to flag. And you go on the website and you'll flag it and it explains all this for you and you say you're finished and then it moves whoa look at this one this is all over the place and you'll kind of go through here and uh you can actually help people find planets so i do encourage you to do this maybe as part of your class you could do it or some other way but it's an incredible website which will help you see how planets are found by the transit technique now i'm going to um slightly switch topics here after I told you about the transit technique. Um, give me a second here, because I've got to get back to my the presentation. All right, Sarah, you just have to click the, oh, we're still going, sorry. Got it. I actually wanted to tell you about one more different planet finding technique, because as part of my job, I get to help work on big space telescopes. And one thing I wanted to do was share with you a really um, incredible way that we hope to use to find planets in the future. Okay, so what we'd like to be able to do is actually block out the star so that we can see the planet directly. And in this picture here, it's showing you a fake image of a star. And now it shows you that magically, imagine that we can block out the starlight and look, see some fake planets around the star. We'd really like to do this. Um, but the problem is we can't do it. Um, it's very complicated to do so. So I actually want to tell you a new mission we're thinking about working on, we are working on, it's called the Starshade. A Starshade launches and separates from its telescope. That's the thing on the left. 
it's actually like a giant flower. It's a huge screen that's tens of meters across. And this thing has very specially shaped petals. It's kind of like a flower. And it has its own spacecraft. And the starshade would use its spacecraft and it would fly very, very far away from the telescope. And this animation is showing you blocking out the starlight so you could see the planet directly. Now this mission isn't up there now. I hope you've all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. That was our first uh, space telescope for astron astronomy. Um, this starshade actually is quite complicated and uh, it's a big, huge thing we want to do in space. It's um, kind of, I'm going to show you the animation one more time. So here's the starshade. It um, joins up, it, launch, it can launch with the telescope and these petals unfurl from a stowed position. And this giant, very specially shaped, incredibly precisely made um, screen will actually uh, be able to do the job of what we're looking for. We're trying to find a planet like Earth orbiting a star like our sun. So part of, believe it or not, searching for planets involves space engineering. And I'm gonna show you um, another couple of pictures here. Here's, um, it's a little loud, but here's a demonstration showing you, just like in the animation, there are these crazy petals that unfurl from the stowed position. And uh, what they're doing is they're testing to see if these petals can unfold and line up exactly how they have to in order for the star shape concept to actually work. Here uh, is the second stage of deployment. And I always get asked, why are there people here? Because there aren't going to be astronauts in space unfolding this special screen. But what the test is repeated over and over again, 25 times or more, to make sure that it, the petals can line up very precisely. It has to be like flatter than a, a flat pancake in order for the star shade to work properly. And this precise shape actually is worked out mathematically. Here's a couple of more pictures about the star shade. Here's myself and two of the, my team members holding a petal just so you can see how big it is. And this very special shape of the very um, uh, pointy tip ends up looking. And here's a picture of the Starshade Lab. Um, but before I finish, I want to tell you why the Starshade is such a special shape. And I'm going to ask you to think about something for a second that I'm pretty sure you've all, you're all familiar with. And that is, um, imagine for a moment dropping a pebble in a pond and you see waves, right? Ripples on the pond. That's what this top picture is showing you. If we had a perfectly circular Starshade, a perfectly circular screen rocking out a star, we wouldn't see nothing. We would see waves. Just like dropping a pebble in a pond, light can act as a wave. And it can bend around the edges of the star shade and create ripples. So instead of a circle in space, we want to put a very special shape. Here's a kind of cartoon of that. And on the right, you can see what our image would look like. We'd see a little point in the middle. But the star shade being a very special shape, what it's like is it's analogous to if you drop a pebble in a pond and don't see any ripples at all. Instead, I want you to imagine that the pond would be perfectly smooth, except all the waves would be pushed to the edges. And so our star shade is a way to block out starlight so we can see planets directly. And the reason I told you about it is it's because my favorite project right now is working on the star shade and trying to figure out how we're going to find another planet like Earth. So to summarize what I talked about so today was I said we talked about what is an exoplanet, and I encourage you to download the software, Eyes on Exoplanets, an exoplanet is a planet orbiting a star other than the sun. We know about thousands of exoplanets, and they're all very different as far as we can tell from what our planets are in our solar system. I briefly reviewed one way to find planets, when the planet goes in front of the star, and the starlight drops by a tiny amount. And I told you that you can go to planethunters.org, where they have data from the Kepler Space Telescope, and you yourself can help to make a discovery. It's not that easy, but you can at least contribute by flagging what might be transits on the light curves. And then I switched topics yet again, and I ended up talking about the starshade, a way of the future to search for uh, planets directly by blocking out the starlight. And that is all I have for you now. Now we're going to switch back to Joe, and we're going to go to questions. Thank you for your attention. All right. All right. Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much. So much. That was incredible. incredible. And I think my favorite part is how much we can do now with citizen science, how anybody at home now and so many different applications can can become an astronomer and they can they can search uh for planets so i think that's so cool i think the website you shared with us is awesome if you send me the link i'll make sure um i pass it on i think it was planet planethunters.org correct okay i'll make sure that gets passed on to the teachers because that is 
such a cool, um, a cool opportunity. So thank you so much for sharing. Let's uh, meet one of our classrooms and let's get a question. So from Palo Alto, California, we have Mrs. Natrogen's group joining us. And I'll turn your microphone on and go ahead with your question. Um, when and how did the Big Bang happen? Well, our Big Bang happened over 13 billion years ago, 13.5 billion years ago. So long ago, it's incredible. How it happened, actually, nobody knows. But I'll just leave you with the thought of the evidence that we have. We have lots of evidence, but the main one is that um, we use this analogy of the fire. And once a fire has burned down, you can see leftover coals glowing. And in fact, all around us, there's a very, very small amount of glowingness in space. And we use that to be able to tell when and how, when the Big Bang happened. But unfortunately, we don't know exactly how. All right, a tough question to start off. Uh, let's meet our next classroom. We have Mrs. Alves' class is joining us from Cortice, Ontario. Um, let me turn, actually, you'll have to turn the mic on for me because you're just off of my screen with the number we have in the Hangout today. So if you don't mind turning your mic on and go ahead with the question. Hi. Hello, I'm Nicholas from Curtis, Ontario. And I have to ask, um, if we did find an exoplanet, what would we do? That was like our Earth. That's a great question. The first thing that I'm going to do is look for signs of life on the planet. We're going to um, look for, listen for radio signals. We're going to look for gases that don't belong. Our own planet Earth has oxygen that we need to breathe. And did you know that if it weren't for plants and bacteria, we would have no oxygen at all? So we're going to look for signs of life by way of gases that don't belong. Now the question I would ask you and your class, what would you do? Because honestly, it's going to be in the hands of kids who grow up to be engineers to figure out what we're going to do next. Some people are trying to figure out a way that we can send a probe, send a spacecraft to another planet, even though they're so far away, it's unfathomable. I personally hope that someday you folks in the next generation will figure out a way that people can hibernate and get sent to those planets. Or even more out there is a concept that we will send our DNA and raw biological materials, and we'll find a way to print people out when we get there. So to answer your question again, we're gonna study exoplanets more to see what's there, but someday we hope someone will find out a way to get there. And by the way, while we're waiting for the next question, I forgot to show you my props, because I have this. This is like a small version of the star shape, actually. It's um, very pointy, and it'll actually make you bleed if you touch it wrong. I wanted to show you that. And I have one more thing to show you while we're waiting for the next question. I'll see if you can see this. I have actually a little thing on my wall over here, which actually is one of the petals of the starshade, one of the ones you saw in the movie. It's actually really big. It's so huge. This itself is five and a half meters. And finally, um, okay, yeah, that's probably it for now. So let's move on to the next question. But it's a great question. I really hope you'll all think about it that exoplanets is like it's a discovery we don't actually know what we're going to do next in a way we're just looking right now and we trust that um we'll have the money and the time and the brains to figure out what to do next all right awesome we have mrs john's group joining us in philadelphia pennsylvania your microphone's on go ahead with the question um, i'm aiden from philadelphia um my question is so scientists believe that life started in water and you yourself said that um you believe that life needs water to sustain well life so i wanted to know do you personally believe that this life or life humans life as we started off as bacteria on this earth developed on earth or do you that it came to us from another planet i see okay good question let me just first address the, the, um, the thinking is evolving so rapidly. And in fact, what you will read in the book or what I just said very simplistically isn't necessarily the final thought. So people believe we could have other liquids. In fact, one of the moons of Saturn, Titan, it has liquid methane lakes, like gasoline on the planet is liquid. And some people think that life just needs a liquid so that uh, molecules can break apart and reform and make more complicated molecules that eventually lead to life. So um, we use liquid water more simplistically because it's very abundant in our universe, so we, we use that. 
Now, I don't know if life originated in water. Um, I wish we understood how life originated so we could give you a more intelligent answer. I believe that life did originate on Earth. I don't think it came from elsewhere. Uh, we, some people believe it might have started even on Mars, for example, and come on a meteorite that crashed to Earth and started here. But all the ingredients for life are here on our planet and almost always have been. And we have had liquid water. So that would be my answer, would be that even if life doesn't need liquid water, that our life here, as far as all the evidence points towards it starting here on Earth. All right. Great question. And I love that answer because, you know, some people might believe there's nothing left to explore or discover, but it couldn't be further from the truth. There's so many great careers in, um, in astrophysics and um, astrology it's, it's, um, or astronomy. It's uh, so much to do. So um, I love that we get to hang out and have this chat today. And even that question is a really great question because we have like our answers, but we're all, we, as scientists, you know, we never get to do every single experiment from scratch. So a lot of my answers are things I've read and adopted. I haven't tested them for myself, for example. So the questions are good to keep asking because, you know, even though all evidence points towards our life evolving here, there's always a chance that some crazy science fiction movie was right and that we came from elsewhere. All right, our next classroom is joining us um, from Franklin Park uh, near Chicago. Uh, they're a grade four or five classroom. I'll turn your microphone on and go ahead. If we, if we do find an expo planet and have enough money to go over there, will you be able to explore it? Great question. The question is, if we, can we go to another planet we'll be able to explore? And the answer is we're not sure. If you think about Mars, we're going to go to Mars hopefully pretty soon, whether that's in five years or ten years. And the question is, can we explore Mars? Well, yes, we can, but we'd have to walk around with a very special spacesuit that provides us oxygen and protects us from the freezing temperatures and also um, from other high energy particles that get through to Mars. So we don't know yet because it's very hard to find out information about planets extremely far away. We use the, we'll use the, we use the Hubble Space Telescope and we have new telescopes, but even then we won't know exactly what's on the planet until we get there. Imagine if you set off on a journey that was going to take you 30 years, okay? How old are you going to be in 30 years from now? And imagine if you, I mean, they're not going to let kids do this, okay? But let's say you're 20 years old, you're an adult, and you go on a journey that's taking 30 years. You're going to get there when you're 50 years old. Wow. Uh, I bet 50 is older than your parents even. That's pretty old, right? So, okay, you're going to get there at age 50, and then what? Are you going to be able to explore? And you won't know until you get there. Like, that's how hard it's going to be. So, most likely, we won't know everything about the planet. Um, and we won't know, for example, if there are poisonous gases that would kill you if you try to walk around, or we won't know what it's going to be like. But I hope that myself and my students, and maybe even some of you, if you become engineers or scientists, might be able to help answer those questions in the future. All right. It's just, it's such a fascinating topic. And there's so much to be learned. So... Uh, I hope there's a lot of uh, boys and girls out there getting excited about space and what um, maybe what they could do in the future. So our final group is Mrs. Penfold's group. They're joining us from Orangeville, Ontario. And I'll turn your microphone on. You can turn your microphone on. Um, what were some of your challenges becoming an astrophysicist? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I think like any job, they're just a level of hard work and dedication. You just have to work very hard. I'd say that was one of the biggest challenges. You know, sometimes I bet you guys have homework and you just, you just don't feel like doing it. Like that happens to me even. You're probably not allowed to admit that when you're in your class, but uh, you just have to, I think the challenges part is just the, men, the number of hours, and this is for any job, just kind of getting through the very tedious parts. Um, of doing it. That's, believe it or not, that's a challenge that almost any job has. And I'd say that was probably my biggest challenge. But I do want to encourage all of you to take the opportunity when you get older, um, you know, to f look for a job. I'd say instead of that, my biggest challenge, I want to tell you my biggest kind of break. I actually grew up in Ontario. And I actually have a cottage on Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. And I go there every summer. It's actually my husband's family's cottage. But I grew up in Toronto, and I actually was really lucky because when I was in university, I was able to get a job at an observatory in the summertime, 
even though I didn't know I was going to be an astronomer for my job, it really helped. I'd say getting a lucky break and, you know, applying for a job and trying to get an internship when you're in high school and when you're um, in college, I'd say that's probably the best thing I can offer you is advice is try to get that job to know whether or not you even want to work in the field. And then it opens up more opportunity. All right, Georgian Bay, that's my favorite spot to dive nearby. I love, are you a diver at all? Sandy side. We're not on the rocky side of Georgian Bay. You may know that like on the western part, it's just white sand. And then yeah. it changes abruptly, right? Right at the Severn River, it turns to the shield. So it's a really big lake. Yeah, no, I love Georgian Bay. It's a beautiful lake. And the rocky side is where there's some really nice shipwrecks, but I'm sure there's some on the sandy side too. No, but yeah. All right, well, Sarah, I can't thank you enough. This was an awesome hangout. Uh, there's some great opportunities for students to dig a little deeper and we'll make sure we get some links out to them so they can do just that. But uh, again, I want to thank you for joining our day celebrating uh, amazing women in science, uh, adventure, conservation, and um, the work you're doing is, is awesome. And I know I'm going to continue following it and I know we'll have some students who are probably going to start doing the same. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks everyone. All right, we're signing off. Boys and girls, thanks so much for the great questions.